The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines. A lot of you have been asking for some watercolor videos, so we thought we'd scratch that itch. Today we have Michael Holter, Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits. Hi. I'm Michael Holter. I'm excited to be here and to be with you today. I'm going to walk you through the seven steps that I take in uh, creating a portrait of a person in watercolor. I use uh, these seven steps to break down the, uh, the, the process. And when I teach my workshops, I have people that, that uh, go from never having painted a portrait to having some success, and they really feel good about it. So I hope that this will translate through this uh, medium. My first step in creating a portrait in watercolor is to what I call shoot straight. Shoot straight means use a camera, get yourself a good photo from that. Now, you may have to shoot hundreds of photos to get the one you really like. But using a digital camera, using a telephoto lens, and capturing people in their natural environment is the best way for me. I like to shoot people that are in sunlight for these. Uh, strong sunlight, light and shadow, and a, uh, a nice range of values, which gives me the best opportunity to create a reasonable likeness and an interesting painting. It's all about the painting in the end anyway, so let's get on to the next step. Step two is I call plan stand. comes from Simon and Garfunkel's song, Got to Make a Plan Stand. What that really refers to is once you get the photo, what do you do with it? I take them into my computer. I look for the one that stands out as the most interesting. And then I really look for how can I crop that photo. So this one here that I'm going to work on today is a, um, a photo of this young lady. And I've cropped in very closely into her um, head and, and the jewelry around her neck because I'm really interested in being a little more intimate with, with her, with, the, with this image. And I have um, purposely planned to highlight certain things. This one doesn't have the eyes and the, and, the, and the features like that of the portrait, but it's got some very interesting angles, some interesting colors, and some things that can really make for a really fun painting. So let's get on with it. Step three is called draw a partner. This is the drawing portion. Now, I'm not trying to prove my drawing skills uh, at this point. I can draw, but I'm not trying to prove that to anybody. What I'm trying to do is get a really good paintable drawing. And I'll use whatever means is, is necessary to get that drawing down. Uh, it's OK if you use a, a grid method, if you use a, a tracing method, if you use a light table. Or I often use a projector right from my computer, right to the projector, right onto the paper, and then draw the portions of the painting that are most important to me. And that's really the details, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and any other little fine details in clothing. In this case here, uh, a lot of this bead work and some of those things. But the rest of it isn't that important. It's important to get the, the main drawing right. So what I do. Um, at this stage is look at my photo and look at the drawing that I've started and see what I've, what I've captured. Is it giving me all the information that I need? Because I have done it 
using some tools like a projector. It may or may not have everything I, I need, and I may want to refine it. I may want to change uh, the shape of her nose. I may want to um, adjust some things. Um, so I usually will go in and alter some of the features a little bit and make sure that I have uh, good markings where there's cast shadows on a face. Now, her face has very little light hitting this side of her face. Most of it's in shadow, so it's a little different than some of them. But wherever you have a strong cast shadow, be very careful to get those things correct. Wherever you have the, uh, wherever the corners of the mouth are, the nostrils, the eyes, this, this eye here is pretty lost into shadow. There's not a lot I can do to, uh, to enhance that. And then wherever there are um, interesting features, like anything around um, this necklace. Now I can paint and, and make up some things or change some things, but basically what I want to do is uh, capture um, the general um, patterns and, and, and details that I might need further down the road. The, the more paint you put over the top of this, the more watercolor paint you put over it, the more you lose the lines. Um, so it's good to have some of them pretty clearly marked. She has some red ribbons braided into her hair. Those could get lost because I have them drawn very lightly right now. I don't want them to be dominant, but I don't want to lose them either. So that's my draw partner phase. The drawing was done off camera uh, onto the, to the uh, paper and then some little tweaks here and there to uh, clean it up. So we are now ready to go on to step four, what I call the glaze phase. The glaze phase really is a phase of putting layers, uh, uh, washes, if you want to call it that, or glazes over the, the entire painting. Um, with these portraits, I try to not leave much white. Now, because her, her blouse is extremely hot and lit pretty, pretty brightly, I'll leave that, a lot of that quite white. I might end up putting some tone on it later, but I'm not going to paint over it right now. Usually, I will um, make an effort to block off everything with some value, some color, some tone. And I usually start with the face. So on the face, I'll start with a, a little bit of uh, raw sienna. Put that on my palette here. I'll put some uh, Scarlet Lake on my palette. Scarlet Lake being the main flesh red that I use. It's a nice transparent uh, and staining uh, red. And I'll use some uh, cerulean perhaps um, in a cooler spot. I may or may not use that in this one here. But those are the um, primary colors basically, yellow, red, and blue. And I can create a, a variety of colors with those. And um, before I really begin to paint, I want to look and make sure that I've got uh, any real bright white highlights on her flesh uh, left, and I'll leave those. But, um, and I've kind of marked where I could put one up here, but there really isn't anything uh, that's too distinctively bright and white. Uh, because this person is, uh, there, there's so much of her face that's in shadow, I'm going to be very careful to make some, to keep some of the warm, uh, raw sienna tones up on this part of her face, on the whole uh, lit portion. And um, where this portion of her face goes into the hair, I'm going to make sure that's real soft. I'm not going to put much pigment over there. I'm going to try to keep this all fairly light. Add some of the Scarlet Lake in here to give it some pinkish tone. But her face is getting lit by the, um, by the sun. Actually, it's not the sun. It's, this is an interior 
uh, studio setting, so it's a, a warm light, though. I always paint my, my, my people using the um, uh, warm light as the, the, the main um, lit side and cool light on the shadow side. Whether they're outdoors or indoors, it just, uh, I don't do a lot of uh, north light, cool um, painting, and I don't really want to feature um, that kind of a, an approach, especially in this um, demonstration. I want to be able to talk about the, um, the lights as if we're outdoors, getting strong sunlight or you're in a window. So I'm trying to keep this uh, a little bit more yellow on the sunlit portion and then go into my reds over here in the shadow portion. If you take the brush, most of the pigment's going to be in the tip, and if you go off, to, like use the heel of it, you'll get a nice gradation off into the area where the hair is. I don't want uh, a hard edge there, so that works very well to just keep a um, soft edge. And I've got the bead of the moisture, the water, going downward. That gives me a nice path for the, um, for the water and the pigment to flow. Now I go into the neck, go straight into the neck and go around that earring. And I want to make sure I get plenty of the, my raw sienna into this area that is the um, portion of her neck where the light is hitting it. Because I'm going to come over and do my second value layer over the top of these colors. Um, and you'll see that later. And this goes up into the hair. Doesn't need to be detailed at all. There is a little bit of um, this area here. Now part of this is going to be more in shadow, part of it's going to be not. And so a lot of this uh, right in here is, um, I just need some value on here that is going to put a tone into this flesh where the light is hitting its strongest. Since I have that on my brush, I'm going to jump down to this little spot of her skin is showing here. I keep that same color on there. Even though it's in shadow on the photo, I want to keep that same underlying color. Here's a piece of her skin over here. As I'm doing this, I'm, my, my eye is catching the fact that I have this blossom potential happening on her chin. Whenever you have a, a place where the water settles and you let it sit too long, I'm lifting it up right now, lifting up that moisture because it would start to blossom up and give me a bad um, blossom there. And, and sometimes those little blossoms are very valuable, but not on a chin of a pretty lady. I don't think that would be a good idea. Part of the uh, planning stage uh, before you begin to paint, really, which I didn't mention earlier, is this taking a, a time to look over your drawing and your painting, deciding where you're going to go you know, where are, like on this here, which, which parts do I paint, which parts do I leave? Uh, having a little bit of an idea and plan in mind before you start painting, because you've got to keep this moving. Keep it moist, keep it moving. Don't let the um, paint 
dry and then continue to try to paint into it. So my chin there does have a little bit of a blossom to it, which it, it'll be okay. But you can see what happened there um, as that was a little bit more pigment sitting there and a little longer. Because I'm painting in a vertical manner, um, this paint comes down uh, and, and flows down pretty nicely, but then sometimes it does um, do that kind of thing. I don't want to go back in there and try to fix that. If I try to do anything with brushing over that and trying to blend that together, it'll totally ruin the, the beautiful passages of watercolor that are going to be laid over. This, is a, this whole process is a layering process. So be, um, be aware that you don't want to try to fix things until they're dry. So here's, uh, there are two more um, little areas of skin tone. One is right here. And the other is on this other, other arm, on the other side. And um, I want to get those painted in at the same time and get started into that. So I'm going to use a raw sienna and, you know, a, a, a little bit of the Scarlet Lake so it gives me a variety of, of color in there. It's not just one, one pigment. So there's the <coughs> first um, glaze pass on the flesh tones. Now I want to go in and put a, um, a, a, a glaze, the first glaze on the other portions. My first um, glaze is completed on the skin tones. <coughs> my first glaze, my first um, pass at the hair needs to be a, um, um, a bit of a, uh, this is a bit of an, an intuitive thing. I'm going to find a color that I feel like will, will benefit me in the long run underneath um, all of this um, darkness that's going to be there. Now there's some highlights up in here. There's a little bit of a, uh, almost like a, a bluish color. It's a lot of times dark hair has some blues. I will, uh, let's put a little bit of that on there just, just to start this and, um, and see what that, that does. And this is just to put an underpainting. I'm going to blend it in, make it just sort of abstract. And I think then I will dry it, make sure it's dry before I go to the next step. So I've got this, now this uh, cerulean blue. Um, it's, um, I love the color. I love the way it looks. Um, it, it's just an underpainting for some of the lights, where some of the light's going to be hitting there. Uh, I'm not going to the darks yet. I'm just going into those underpainting values. And I'm going to put in some, um, some uh, burnt sienna, raw sienna mixture, just some, just some tones that will help me to um, kind of get a feel for what's going on over here um, that will end up being an underpainting, basically for some of these hair areas, some tones in the hair. Um, her hair kind of does things out in here. Uh, I want that to be soft. Um, I'm just sort of playing a little abstractly with this right now. And this is going to be some of the underpainting for the hair. Now I'm going to go a little different. I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to take the same colors I have. I'm, what, I, what I refer to as my stew. When I paint, this uh, all becomes a, a series of grays and tones that happen in my palette because I pick up different colors and mix them together on the palette. And that happens to, to uh, add some 
value changes, some shifts in color, some, uh, some kinds of uh, things you can't get if you try to be too careful and try to mix too precisely. And I like sometimes what I end up with uh, in this stage and end up not doing much more with it. In this case here, I intend to go quite a bit darker on these areas. We'll see what happens as we go. Maybe a little more of the ultramarine blue to cool it down on the back side here. And again, this is a uh, bit of a process. You got to think about this as a value layer, not a not the completeness of it. You're not trying to do the colors, all the colors accurately. Um, this part of the the neck gets very dark in here, and so does this uh, uh, this part of her necklace and the um, these uh, beads gets very dark, goes right into the hair, so I kind of like bringing unity by uh, developing these areas and having them all flow together. Uh, a lot of times you can, you can end up with a really nice passage of color by just not stopping right away and making distinct edges and shapes, whereas this is, this is well, one big dark area right in here. Um, eventually, this will um, all get merged together with my um, other layers. So by just bringing this down in here, I end up with, I, um, I think, a nice passage. And that's what I want right now. Just a nice passage of, of color and value and I'm going to just get it lighter as it goes down in here and let it just kind of flow as a background for this right now. I'm not going to do all of it, just a portion. And if I wanted to drop some other colors in there, um, I could do that. I think I'll just leave it. So, the next thing I'm going to do, um, there's a little bit of her shawl on this shoulder and a little tiny bit on this shoulder, which um, in the end are going to have that feel of the red. But there's, a, there's a, um, other colors in here that are, um, that are yellow, orange, whatever the, whatever the threads in that fabric. R. So I'm going to start with a um, orange uh, and, and just paint the whole thing in with an underlying color that I will be able to res reserve uh, and paint around those little areas of th those thread areas, those brocade areas, I guess you can call them. And it'll make for an interesting passage. But I need that base color. In watercolor, you are always looking to paint light to dark and working your um, lighter and brighter values down first so that when you come in with your darks, uh, you're going to still have an opportunity to preserve some of the detail in an area like that. Now on the right side over here, the right bottom side, I just need to cover this with that same orange color, very simply. Looking up at this now, uh, I realize I have erred. I should have painted this um, uh, part of her skin values in over here when I was doing the skin tone. So I'm going to come back to that. And uh, it's going to be dark in here anyway, but I'll just make sure I get this treated um, properly. 
this is very wet and flows very nicely. I'm not pushing it around. I'm using a big brush. I'm directing where it goes with this tip of my brush, but I'm not really painting it a lot. I'm, it, the water is doing the work here. The water and the, uh, the pigment are just flowing out of the brush down onto the surface of the paper. And you can see it stays within the boundaries, um, the lines that I've drawn. And um, I pick up a little bit of it at the bottom here so it doesn't blossom on me. So I've got to do something on the background. In this um, composition, I have really um, a little bit of the background showing up on the top right, a little bit bigger here, and a little bit bigger here. I've got it cropped in pretty tightly, but I like to I like to break up my background compositionally and use maybe three uh, spaces like that in the background. It's, I like the trinity, the trinity, the three objects, the three sizes of the background are very good compositionally. Um, so I'm going to think about that as I go forward. And I've got to do something now with the, with the color on the, on the blouse. The blouse is going to have uh, a, a stronger shadow on this part, but I need some I need a little bit of color in here. And it's got to be in that blue range. Um, and I need some color in the background, which on the photo shows up as uh, fairly blue. Um, I will probably do the same thing. I'll probably keep it that way. Let me use, um, I'm gonna clean my palette a little bit here. Get rid of some of this. keep the colors a little bit more pure. Um, I always keep a paper towel in my hand to check the, the amount of moisture in my brush to re remove some of the moisture. It's a very important step, I think, in, in painting this way. If you don't, you got, you got to have a sponge here as well. I use that to uh, wipe some of the moisture off my brush. And uh, there's a a delicate balance of how much moisture you keep in your brush uh, at all times. So I'm going to start with some cerulean blue. And I think I'll start up here and just work right into this, this thing of the hair that I was doing earlier. This is going to be a light value that is basically going to be here to put a, to be a foil for the rest of the face. It's not meant to be very strong or dark. This is meant to be a pretty light value. Um, but I want some color on it. And what happens with when you're painting watercolor like this, the more you take care of these white areas and reduce those white areas, the more the rest of the colors come alive, and the more value uh, you get in, in, in the range of values. So there will be some whites on this, uh, on this painting. Some of them, some of my portraits have uh, literally no white left on the paper. There's some tone on everything. And this one, because of this large white area of her blouse, I will keep a lot of white there. And when watercolor, watercolor teachers talk about preserving the whites, um, yeah, there's a point where whites are important, but it's more important to preserve the light that's shining through the pigments. It may not be really white, it may be a tone, but it's the lightest, brightest, most vivid tone because the beauty of watercolor is that transparency and the way it, the light shines through the pigment, hits the paper, bounces back to your eye with those wonderful colors that you have laid down. So there's, um, 
that part I'm going to put a little up in this corner, my little, my little baby spot there, and then my middle size background spot right here. And if I go into the hair with this, it doesn't matter because it's going to be, uh, all of it's going to be painted uh, probably a little darker as we get going. And if I just decide to, I don't, I can even be artsy. Is that artsy or not? I don't know. But you don't really need to worry about what goes on up in here. Uh, this is all going to be um, painted over. A little splatter here, a little fun. And that's what makes watercolor interesting, I think. And it's good to free you up. Sometimes I'm, sit I'm sitting here now doing all these little, little detail things and just doing that says, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not hung up in, in the little things. I've got some specks that have shown up here because of my splattering. My brushes flick some things on. Those, those will be gone. You won't even notice those. Now, this part of her, her blouse, I do need to get some tones on there. I think what I'll do is I'm going to switch from the cerulean blue, which is a, a little cooler blue, to an ultramarine, which is a little warmer. It's a, it's a, um, almost has a little bit of a violet cast to it. And I'm going to put, um, I'm going to paint this section in, leave some of the whites here. I'm going to do it fairly lightly because I'm going to come in again with a passage over that. But I need, to, I need to kill this white in here where this shadow's uh, going down. Now this is typically my next glaze phase step is to go in and do the shadow pattern, this particular shadow area. So here we are putting in this area that is primarily in shadow here. And um, I am trying to define some of the shapes that are here. And again, it's all about shape and form. We're, we're about, um, we're painting the, um, the way light happens, the way light falls on objects. That's what painting is all about, is, is convincing a viewer that there, that there is a real three-dimensional object. And the only way to do that is to show the viewer where the light is, where the light is coming from, where the light is, uh, how the light is affecting uh, the person or the object, um, the trees, whatever it is. In this case here, how is light falling across this white blouse? And what is happening with that light? And right in here, it's going in and it's, the light is hitting those little floral shapes on the blouse. So I've got to go around them a little bit. And um, we go down in here. And then I'll need to pick out some of those floral shapes in, uh, in here that are not getting hit by, this, by the direct light. I'll do that later. And the light bounces under there and comes across there. So this is a jump into the shadow pattern painting, but it's also part of the first pass that I need to do to get some color on some of these areas. So. Now the color on the, uh, on the photo, photos can tend to um, uh, distort color, obviously. They don't always pick up the colors the way they are, and depending on how your printer prints, if you're using a print. If you're painting directly from a, um, 
computer screen, that, that's another thing. You have uh, other issues. And here I dropped a little bit of violet in because I see some violet happening in, in this area. And um, it just brings out a little more interest. This whole part of her blouse right in here is getting shadow. We need a little more, need a, maybe put a little reddish tone into the violet here because there's some, there's, those are light but have some, some reddish feel to them. Um, And that could be reflected light coming off of her face, making it a little more red, or it could be, um, could even have a bit of transparency in the, um, in this blouse, I don't know. And you can put a little more, put, go back into the blue a little bit more in here. And there's some little details there we can just randomly indicate. So there's the basics of it. I, I can I'll probably fill in some more little things here and there as we as we get into it uh, a little later. But that's enough for now. Um, soften this a little in there. Take a damp brush sometimes and soften some of these edges. You've got um, the way f fabric folds and moves. You you have to have some lost and found edges on some of these forms. They're not uh, they're not as they're not just clear clean cut shapes. Sometimes they vary a little bit. So I'm still in step four of the glaze phase right now, and I'm going to go down the face now and do another glaze, which is going to be the shadow pattern. We're going to try to build this whole portion of her side of her face a little bit. Not, not too fast, not too strong. We'll do it gradually. Uh, these tones need to be in the similar tones, colors as we have here, the local color that we put on there. But we need to um, uh, be a little strong but I don't want to overdo it either, but this is all in basically in shadow. I'm going to clean my palette a little bit again here. I'm going to pick up back to my Scarlet Lake that I've been using. Uh, back to the raw sienna. And I might actually put a little bit of violet in, so I'll put a little violet out on my, it's a quinacridone violet. That will cool down the, um, the colors into the shadow areas, probably. So my Scarlet Lake um, raw sienna mixture, uh, I don't want to go all the way across and blend the whole forehead. I'm going to start with um, an area right in here and place a value on it. Rinse that brush out a little bit and soften this edge up where it goes into the hair and soften some of this over here. Take a damp brush and take a um, little time to blend, not, not blend in the sense I'm not trying to blend the whole forehead, but all I'm doing right now is softening an edge to make that edge less strong. I want, this, I want to build a shadow over here that will work and give me a um, sense of volume in this face. And I want to keep working this down 
there's going to be a the eyebrow is going to be over here. It's going to be dark, but this is going to go into a shadow. It's going to come off of her um, forehead here, and it's going to go across here. This is all going to be in shadow. So you see, I'm getting a little darker down in here. I don't want to get too dark, like I said. I want it to be a um, distinct um, value shift, though. My, my painting techniques involve using the, um, the colors I like, not so much the colors that I see in front of me. I'm looking at the value here, and I'm placing a value that's important to this form. I'm not worrying about the... Um, exactness of that um, form. I'm going to soften an edge here a little bit. Um, on this nose, I'm going to soften a little bit up in here. Take a little damp brush. Looks like that brush was a little bit dirty, actually. Lift some of that back. Now I've got to get back, right back into this here before it dries. It already is almost. I do have a bottle here that I can spritz this with. Um, Cast shadow, pretty much almost a cast shadow off the nose there. There's a, um, this is going to be in shadow up in here. Um, just trying to make sure I don't have any excessively odd blossoming going on there. Now her, her lips are um, pretty much in shadow there, and then also this portion of them, so I can just go right over that. And there's a shadow cast right there. And then this goes into shadow. So continuing on down into the neck now, I'm going to add a little more pigment onto my palette here. And I'm going to run right down from here. Really don't see the difference there between the, the chin and the, um, the neck for a while until you get down into here. And this could have a little more violet into it because uh, it's going to be cool. I'm going to soften this up into there. Add a little more um, of the raw sienna. Warm this up a little bit.
So here's where I'm, I'm following a very light pencil line that I put in indicating where the shadow is. So again, part of the drawing portion of this, um, of this art is to make sure you have a pretty good indication of where shadows are going to fall and that can be done with a very very limited um, amount of drawing but you need some some drawing there to to work it and to have a um, to have a sense of where where the shadows start and stop now this part of the shadow leads right into a soft gradation off into nothing. This part here where her, her neck is, is goes into a soft area. You've got to watch those little little soft transitions. You don't need to do every soft transition but some of them have to be made so you have a variety of shadow shape. I'm going to add a little violet into this portion right here. A little violet transition, which is nice. So every 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 little shape portion you need to kind of treat as a nice little shape. Now, this portion of her neck over here is just as dark as there, almost. It's got a little more orange bouncing into it. There's some, I'm going to start with some orange because there's some light bouncing back into her shoulder here. It's changing that color a little bit, but the value's still the same. I'm going to go back to the reds here. And, um, And even a little bit of the violet, because it gets cooler and darker down into here. So that transition of that little passage is a lot of fun to paint, a lot of fun to see. It's a visually interesting little area. And. Um, We'll paint these beads here in a second, and then it'll make more sense, too. So um, over on the other side of the neck over here, this light is coming through here. There's quite a bit of orange uh, value into that. And um, I think I indicated that painted that oranginess in there when I first did the pass, but I'm going to continue that with a second glaze in this shadow pattern process that we're doing. With some more of that orange. And, um, and we'll shift that a little bit into the reds of the um, rest of the, of the um, skin tones that we've been using. And since it goes down into there, um, could go a little violet, but I don't know, maybe that would... Still seems pretty bright on the photo. I'd like to keep that. Um, then this part in, in, in between these uh, beads is um, some of the same color, but there, it, it becomes much more cool. So let's um, add some of that violet in there. Just a touch of the quinacridone violet into the pigment we're already working in. Um, So with the skin tones, um, I have a habit of staying away from very cool colors, pigments, until later in the process. 
because that's where you can end up with some, some mud. Mud is going to happen when you mix around and push paints around too much. But mud can also happen if you are glazing like this and you glaze, um, you put a cool color down and then end up putting some um, uh, warm tones over it because it's, you've got to go warmer and you end up getting some of those muddy areas uh, with watercolor. And you don't really want that, so. And I add a little of this violet into there. And most of this, there's a, just a touch of, of the violet on my palette mixed in with those other colors in my stew. And um, it's not like a lot, and it's not like this. Quinacridone violet that I use is very potent very uh, strong. If you get too much on your brush, it'll just it'll really explode. So you've got to be gentle with it. So that's the um, the shadow pattern on the face. My glaze, my my, my glaze phase is, is still moving along here. Um, we're into the shadow pattern on the glaze phase. So here's another little shadow area on the arm. I'm going to go in here and uh, I'm just going to hit the, this area right in here with a little bit of value. There's a shadow falling behind on, on the edge of the shawl and it kind of makes a gradation um, out here where the sun, the light is actually hitting it a little more. I'll just soften this edge down there and leave that little harder edge up there. On this other side, this is all pretty much in shadow. Uh, there's a little bit of a cast shadow here. Let's just make that a little darker. I'll put a little violet in there just to cool it a little bit. So there's a couple of areas where I have not um, put my first glaze on, which um, I should do, and those uh, really revolve, uh, involve the, uh, the jewelry. I'm going to use some uh, quinacridone gold, and I'm going to do an underpainting here on this earring of the quinacridone gold, just because it's going to be a generally a gold earring. That's going to give me the nice bright underpainting. And this medallion down here uh, is, has the same gold um, undertones. I'm going to put that on there as well. So this is the uh, gold undertones for this, what will be all the details and color onto this, those two pieces of jewelry. And then all this other jewelry has some tone to it. Um, and I'm going to exaggerate some of it a little bit on the, um, but I need to put a little bit of a tone on some of these beads, just a, a little bit of a, a neutral, neutral tone. I'm going to just use some burnt sienna, very thinly applied uh, to some of these beads here. There's some uh, beads that are going to end up being, um, have some volume to them and I'll paint more to, onto them later, but for right now I'm going to just put a little bit of local color on them. And it's these guys here. These guys here. I might even uh, leave a little bit of a highlight on, on this one here. Uh, these over here are all in shadow, so they don't really have any highlight on them, so I just need to kill that white. Biggest thing about looking at you know details like this, make sure that they all all the value of those things is, is close to what 
what it should be. This is all in shadow over here, so there won't be any whites bouncing in there. They'll be lighter uh, than other things, but there won't be any real whites. There are two um, beads here that are more colorful. They're actually kind of purpley. And I'm going to make those, um, I'm going to paint those purple. Um, with this violet, but I'm going to leave just a hint of white on there as if it's getting a little reflection there where the light is hitting it. And I'll come back in and do more values. So again, we're, I'm not trying to paint the whole shape of it at one time. I'm trying to just get the local color in. This is backing up a bit to my first phase, my phase one um, glaze, which is getting the local color on. So the rest of the beads, uh, these beads all have um, uh, their warm tones. And uh, I can treat them in different ways. But I think I need to put a little bit of um, uh, color under them uh, just to kind of set the tone here. I'll use some of this quinacridone rust, which is a nice warm brown with a little bit of strength to it. So I'm just going to paint this whole string of beads with that color. I may actually end up with a few areas where I leave some whites because there are some white highlights on these beads. I might just leave that a little bit there. So the, be uh, the uh, painting the beads, and I have, at the same time, I'm going to talk about the bead. <laughs> the bead of the water, you know, this bead of water is coming down, and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm letting that flow. You see how that just flows? So the flow of the, of the water and the, uh, the nature of this is coming out of the brush. I've got, a, got this board tilted so that I'm, the gravity is taking it down. I'm not brushing it around a lot. I'm just letting it flow. As it comes out of the brush, it just works its way down. And I can change the color a little bit anytime. Add other color. There's a little violet thrown in there just to change it up a little. If I want to make it warmer, I can add a little warmth to it. Um, but right now, I'm just trying to kill the white here. But the, the flow of, of pigment off the, off the brush is the, this is one of those fun parts of watercolor that people don't get sometimes. You end up brushing it around thinking it's like oil paint or acrylic paint. It's not. It's, this, is, um, this is the flow of the way watercolor should work. I think. So I'm going to start that same process up here on this other side and do this whole set of beads. I've already painted some into that. I'm going to start, I'm going to start right up there at the same place. Actually, I'm going to start down here. Um, and I'm going to just you know, be a little loose with it right up there because I've I've already got part of it painted with some other colors. Maybe it's the way sun catches a face, an expression, the smiling eyes of someone you love. There is something about people that calls you to paint them. And you've tried. Again and again you've tried. But... Are you totally happy with them? What if your most successful portraits are dull and lifeless? Where do you even begin to regain your confidence? It's time to breathe life into your portrait painting with Michael Holter's Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits. In Michael's video, you'll discover that what you need is a solid plan for your portrait painting. Exactly seven simple steps. 
If you follow these steps, you'll find that your paintings will take on a life and vitality that lifts them from the ordinary. In Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits, you'll discover how to get a good composition for your painting and how to get it down onto your drawing paper accurately every time. You'll uncover Michael's secrets for using warm and cool for a portrait that sparkles, plus numerous tips that bring it all together. The one thing that a watercolor artist should know or should do is to get rid of fear. Fear is the biggest enemy to making uh, successful watercolors. It's a, it's a killer. You've got to be able to paint without that in intimidation. Watch as Michael works through two complete portrait demonstrations and paint along to gain the confidence that you can do this on your own. You'll be amazed at how accomplished you feel when creating portraits that look like your subject but are still painterly. People are complicated, but painting them doesn't have to be. Through Michael's seven steps, you'll discover the freedom of working through your painting one confident step at a time. Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits with Michael Holter, available on DVD or digitally to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today. That was Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits with Michael Holter. You can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. And now let's get right to the interview. I was always interested in, in art, and I had a beginning um, without very much formal training. I first started to paint when I was uh, in college. I really uh, had very little training in high school in art, but I always was uh, an artist in, in many ways. I liked art, I liked music. Um, I finally decided uh, in my early 20s that art was the career I should pursue, and I uh, was in an art program and uh, started to paint um, a variety of ways. I, I did design courses and a lot of different things, but my first uh, first two paintings, I guess, a watercolor and an oil, were both plein air paintings that I did uh, and uh, were, you know, relatively successful. Um, so the first paintings really began at that point, and I've been painting all ever since, off and on. I'm inspired to paint by the situations around me by what I see. I, I, I'm uh, one who goes uh, and we travel and I like to uh, see these places and then I like to bring them back and put them on, on paper or canvas. I like, I like uh, light. I like light and shadow. I love the way light plays across a, a, a field or a light plays across a, a person's face, either one. Um, it's really about the light. That's really the key for me. So it's inspiration for, for all that, it really comes from uh, enjoying God's creation and the people and the places. It's a, it's a remarkable, remarkable thing. The subject that I'm most known for is probably the portraits. Uh, I began to paint those earnest, in earnest about uh, eight years ago, and the um, people seem to really respond to them. And I've, I've found that, that uh, we as humans respond to portraits, we respond to humans. Um, and there's a lot of interest in painting portraits by people who paint watercolor. And so what happened with that was as soon as uh, people began to respond to those uh, portraits I was doing, I got requests to teach and to do workshops. And so all that began to develop into the, a lot of the things I do today. And it was a um, process that, that was very interesting because I always was a landscape painter back for many, many years, and I didn't really paint much in uh, many portraits until about, you know, eight years ago. And as I began to do that, I, I really began to love them more and more. And again, like I said, I get a lot of response to them. I've been painting landscapes um, recently and moving more towards landscapes. One of the things that is interesting is that when I have a show, uh, people come to see the portraits 
but they often buy the landscapes. Uh, so there's, a, there's an interesting dichotomy there. They're, they're intrigued by the people, but most people don't want uh, someone else staring at them from their wall. I have customers that have several paintings of uh, cowboys, for instance, uh, collectors who like to have that kind of art. But most people would rather have a landscape, interestingly. Watercolor is a really great medium uh, for a lot of reasons. It's, uh, it's it, one that's very portable, very handy, um, very clean. Um, there's not the issues with oils and oil paints and, and solvents. Uh, but more than that, it's just the way it handles. Um, the watercolor is pure pigment, uh, you know, strong or diluted with a little bit of water, and you get wonderful, remarkable colors and, and transitions that um, is a, it's a different animal with, uh, with oils or other medium. Watercolor has a, a spontaneity that, um, to me, the way I paint, is very, very spontaneous and very fluid. Uh, watercolor can be used um, very uh, uh, photorealistically and very tightly. Um, my, my preference is to be more uh, representationally uh, impressionistic. So I like to have things uh, flow a little bit more and uh, have a little bit more spontaneity. And I guess that just suits my personality. Um, watercolor was a, was a choice early on in my life. Uh, when we were young, married, um, I was going to do some art, uh, chart shows, and sell some things. And um, what happened was um, the watercolors that I was doing sold better than other things, and I needed to make a living because we had uh, we had a young child and we were uh, we didn't have much income. So I was selling paintings uh, to make a living, and watercolors were quick to produce, and I could sell them. And so it became a sort of a necessity in a way, um, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of factors led into it, but it, it just kind of stuck with me. I still paint I paint oils too. But the watercolor seems to have uh, kind of gotten a hold of me. I'm, I'm much more uh, familiar with watercolor and um, content with how it works. The thing I love most about watercolor is the um, spontaneous nature of it. I love the um, the way that it, it um, the, the pigments flow together. Uh, again, water and the pigment is really the main part of the of the process. Uh, different papers have a little different way of of responding. But basically, it's a very simple process, and it's a, um, uh, a it's one that um, has such vibrant uh, colors, such vibrant light, uh, the light bouncing off the paper, uh, going through the transparent layers of watercolor, is something that you, you really uh, can't get in any other medium. I think that the most difficult thing about watercolor really is the, um, the planning part. The part that leads up to watercolor, I think a lot of times people that are uh, unfamiliar with watercolor find it hard to understand it because they don't realize that you have to plan ahead. You have to think through things. It's a little bit like a game of chess. You know, ch good chess players think many, play many plays down the road, uh, and that's a bit like what you have to do with watercolor. You have to think ahead. With uh, some other mediums, you can scrape off things, paint over things, do a lot of uh, manipulation at, at, at m mid and late points. Watercolor, you have to have uh, uh, something in mind that you want and you need to, to pursue that and um, you know, work toward the, toward the end result without uh, um, the opportunity to go backwards. Probably the painting that I'm most proud of is a painting that I did of my wife, Cindy. Uh, it's a painting that I did, and um, it was uh, the first painting that I got into the National Watercolor Society, and it got, uh, helped me to get my signature award, or signature membership. It was a painting that I, um, I did for, uh, leading up to entering into the show, and uh, I was desperately trying to get uh, something painted that I thought would get in the show and, and make it in. Uh, and I didn't have much time left. It was summer, and I went and woke my wife up one morning early, and I said, can you be beautiful today? And she, of course, said yes. 
And so I asked her to come outside into the sunlight, bring some white clothes, some things to wear and change in and out of. And I shot um, probably 600 photos of her in different clothing and different settings out in, in our yard. I went back into my computer with those 600 photos and just started scanning through them. And I found one that I really liked the composition of. And I began to paint it. And it turned into a, a, a winner. Um, it was, um, it's called Lace and Grace. And it's, it's, she's wearing a lace blouse. There's light kind of filtering through the blouse. There's a light bouncing off her hair. She's got her hands in it. And it's, the, it's a lovely painting. Uh, it's a painting that, like I said, got me uh, into the National Watercolor Society for the first time. And it, and it was sold uh, to a, uh, a permanent collection at a, at a university. So it, it, had a, has a, uh, it had a great beginning. And, and then now it's in a place where it will be there for, for many years for people to enjoy. So that's really special. The one thing that a watercolor artist should know or should do is to get rid of fear. Fear is the biggest enemy to making uh, successful watercolors. It's a, it's a killer. You've got to be able to paint without that in intimidation. And again, it seems like watercolors run into that problem because they're, they're, part of it is the nature of it. It's, it seems unforgiving. But you've got to learn how to handle it in such a way that you can change anything you want to. You can, you know, you can make changes. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be a disaster. <laughs> Some parts look like disasters. You can still work with them. So it's a. It, it, it's a part of it's just overcoming that fear. Um, and, and that's true for any any painting, um, any any kind of art form. The, sometimes the fear of failure is the biggest uh, problem. People in general, people should paint because it is a tremendous way to express your own uh, feelings, your own emotions. And I, I believe it's, a, it's an important part of me expressing my, my, my love for creation, for what God's created, for the way um, he made me. Um, it's, a, it's a very rewarding experience. There's not many experiences that you have like that that are individual, um, like painting. I used to, I've been in music, I've been in a lot of, um, I've been in corporate uh, art settings where I was a creative director and, and worked with, with writers and designers. I've been in the music world where I've worked with other musicians. And those collaborative things like that are really fun for a creative person. I've spent my life in, in creative work. And I love that collaborative creative aspect. But there's something about the process and the success of painting and being, doing it, um, your, your thing, your own thing, um, the way you want to do it. The one thing I would tell a student to help them paint better is to let go, to, to get rid of the fear and just enjoy what they're doing. Really have fun with it. There's, there's nothing to be lost and, and uh, there's no uh, intimidation that's so great that you should stop and just keep going. That was Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraiture with Michael Holter. It's a terrific video. If you want to learn more, you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. I hope you're enjoying these videos. I'm enjoying giving them to you. I'm Eric Rhodes. Maybe it's the way sun catches a face, an expression, the smiling eyes of someone you love. There is something about people that calls you to paint them. And you've tried. Again and again you've tried. But are you totally happy with them? What if your most successful portraits are dull and lifeless? Where do you even begin to regain your confidence? It's time to breathe life into your portrait painting with Michael Holter's Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits. In Michael's video, you'll discover that what you need is a solid plan for your portrait painting. Exactly seven simple steps. If you follow these steps, you'll find that your paintings will take on a life and vitality that lifts them from the ordinary. 
In Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits, you'll discover how to get a good composition for your painting and how to get it down onto your drawing paper accurately every time. You'll uncover Michael's secrets for using warm and cool for a portrait that sparkles, plus numerous tips that bring it all together. The one thing that a watercolor artist should know or should do is to get rid of fear. Fear is the biggest enemy to making uh, successful watercolors. It's a, it's a killer. You've got to be able to paint without that in intimidation. Watch as Michael works through two complete portrait demonstrations and paint along to gain the confidence that you can do this on your own. You'll be amazed at how accomplished you feel when creating portraits that look like your subject but are still painterly. People are complicated, but painting them doesn't have to be. Through Michael's seven steps, you'll discover the freedom of working through your painting one confident step at a time. Seven Steps to Watercolor Portraits with Michael Holter, available on DVD or digitally, to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today. Thank you.